I'm Ian Davis, and I, uh, I work as a product engineer at Prismatic. Um, and I'm here to talk about the challenges and benefits of a functional reactive front end. Um, really excited to give this talk, uh, and have been for a long time. And then I found out I was going right after Rich on the main stage. And my brain still hurts a little. Um, but, but I think it'll be a good talk. Um, so I want to start off with this quote by Tony Hoare, um, which some of you have probably heard of before. It says that there are two ways of constructing a software design. One is to make it so simple that there are no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. The first method is far more difficult. And the reason I like this quote is because it touches on something that Rich Hickey talked about on this very stage a couple of years ago, that there's a significant difference between simple and easy. Easy means something is near at hand or easily accessible, while simple implies sort of a, a lack of complexity, that it only does one thing. Um, and it's important to note that ease does not necessarily imply simplicity. In fact, without a lot of work, ease can often lead to something that's very complex. Um, so what is this talk actually going to be about? Um, well, the goal is to assemble a flexible toolbox that sort of simplifies the traditional complexities of web development. Um, at Prismatic, we have a pretty heavy emphasis on design, and we're still figuring out our core product, which means that we can't really rely on an architecture that assumes anything about our application state or structure. Um, so we need something that's flexible, that lets us build quickly and iterate fast. Um, we're also very functional. Um, we've used Clojure to great success on the back end, and so we wanted to see what technologies out there can we use to apply a lot of the same principles to front-end web development. Um, so more specifically, I'm going to talk about what the sort of traditional complexities in JavaScript are and where they come from. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why ClojureScript is a good solution for, for solving a lot of these complexity and gives us a lot of good basic tools um, to help out web development. And then I'm going to talk about uh, React, a JavaScript framework by, by Facebook, and how its functional approach to DOM manipulation is, is really better than anything else out there if you want to do sort of functional declarative UI development. Um, then I'm going to talk about Ohm, which is a library that combines ClojureScript and React together, and it gives us some really nice benefits of the marriage of these two technologies. And uh, finally, I'm going to wrap up by talking about sort of the, the practical challenges and benefits that we get from this architecture. Um, as far as I know, we're the largest production OMAP, um, and we're certainly one of the largest ClojureScript apps as well. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we've sort of, benefits that we've gotten, and hopefully this will help you decide if, if this, this might work for you. Um, so let's start with, with what problems JavaScript has. Um, the first book that most web developers are typically handed is JavaScript, The Good Parts. Um, and that's because the good parts of JavaScript are, are actually a quite small subset of the language as a whole. Um, how many of you have ever participated in a hackathon before? Um, and now keep your hand raised, or raise your hand again, if you are really proud of the quality of your code at the end of that hackathon. Um, JavaScript was made in 10 days in May, and Brandon Ike shipped it as a prototype far too soon, and he wasn't really able to go back and change it. And I think sort of this is where a lot of JavaScript's inconsistencies and quirks come from. You get things like the double equals equality operator that, that automatically typecasts everything to a string, because that makes a lot of sense when you're, when you're trying to determine if things are equal. Um, and when you combine that with their original design goals, that they, they wanted a language for non-Java programmers, non-programmers even, which could be written directly in HTML, something that designers, beginners, and amateurs could learn by the yard. What this really boils down to is that JavaScript was designed to be easy and accessible. And it actually worked out pretty great for the web. You know, the, the dev console's right there. You can get immediately results. And I think this easiness is what's made it one of the most ubiquitous platforms out there. Um, a lot of designers I know can, can code in JavaScript and, and do HTML and CSS, but the number, of JavaScript, or, sorry, the number of designers who can write an iOS app or an Android app, I can basically count on one hand. Um, 
But if you think back to our, our Tony Hoare quote, simple is hard. And making something that's both easy and simple is even harder. And Netscape just didn't invest the time required to make things simple and easy. So we're left with a language and a platform that's simple and quite complicated, or sorry, that's, that's easy and quite complicated. Um, and there's a lot of unpredictability that comes from these pitfalls. Um, the most common example people use is, is this sort of implicit globals, which in this function here, I'm trying to define a local variable. But if I accidentally forget the var declaration, which is very easy to do, suddenly I'm mutating this, this variable in the scope above mine. Um, and JavaScript just assumes that, that this is what you want to do. And if you don't have a global variable there, that's OK. It, it'll go ahead and create one for you. Um, and even when you know about this pitfall, it's very easy to forget. And JavaScript doesn't really throw any errors to, to tell you that you might have made a mistake. And it gets even more insane when you consider hoisting, because even though this is defined without the var statement at the top, if someone else much later in this function defines it with a var statement, that'll automatically get hoisted to the top, meaning that it's impossible to tell at first glance whether I'm dealing with a local or a global variable. Um, but the problem here isn't really the global hoisting. It's, it's the fact that you have this global mutable state. And this is a problem even on local levels. Um, when I pass in foo, I don't really know what that function's doing to it. It could come back out anything else. Um, and if you do have a bug in your code, Tracking it down is a nightmare because you know it could have been mutated by any one of these functions. There's there's no way to easily track where these changes are being made, um, and I think that with JavaScript you really need something that's that's going to warn you of these pitfalls. It's going to make sure that you don't make the easy mistakes. Um, and for a lot of people, the solution is is JS Lint, which is a good way to prevent a lot of the more sort of silly things that JavaScript does. But things like mutable state, JSLint doesn't really correct for because you know, that's, that's an opinion that the language has that making things easier with mutable state is a good idea. Um, and we sort of disagree, which is why we chose ClojureScript as our language of choice. Um, unlike some of the, the sort of JavaScript compiled languages out there, it's not just cosmetic differences. Um, ClojureScript actually adds real value to our development process. Um, it creates a very simple set of sort of basic tools. And with the power of macros, it allows it to be really, really easily extendable so that we can write our own tools to sort of build upon the language itself. Um, so if we look at, at lexical scoping, um, this is sort of how you do it in JavaScript. And it looks structurally very similar to the let binding in ClojureScript. And that's because ClojureScript basically takes the, the best practices that you should otherwise be doing in JavaScript, and it sort of enforces and codifies them in the code. Um, and there's no way to sort of accidentally fuck up this let binding because you know, mutable refs are so much different than normal immutable values that you really, really know when you're changing something. Um, and you, you, sort of the same reason that we like a good type system or a good test suite, ClojureScript provides these guardrails that prevents us from sort of using the bad parts of JavaScript and falling into these pitfalls. Um, and this, I think, is another example of something in JavaScript that's, that's sort of incidentally complex. There's four different. There's four sort of slightly different ways that this gets bound, and it gets magically bound behind the scenes. And once you've been programming for a long time, you, you learn to memorize these four different ways, but it's really not necessary for there to be four different ways. In ClojureScript, we only have one method of, of sort of binding this, and we're not even binding it. It's explicitly passed in as the first argument to, to protocol functions. Um, and so I, I think JavaScript is getting a lot better. And so I want to talk a little bit about, about sort of ECMAScript 6, because they've, they've got a lot of nice things that are coming down the line that are trying to improve the language. 
Um, there's some bad things too, and they still have to leave a lot of these pitfalls in there for, for backwards compatibility. But this is one of those. And this is um, um, the yield operator, which allows you to create, in this case, an infinite sequence of Fibonacci numbers. And it gives you back a generator that you sort of call next on to get each next value. Um, and in ClojureScript, we sort of already have the ability to build up a lazy sequence like this very easily. Um, I think it's a little bit cleaner to have you know, a long, lazy sequence that you can use sequence processing functions on. It's, it's still immutable. You don't have this, this sort of stateful object that you have to keep calling the next method on. Um, but I think more importantly, I can ship this code right now. And I think this is true of a lot of the good things that are sort of you know, a couple months or a couple years down the line with ECMAScript 6, is that ClojureScript sort of already has this functionality right now. And something like transducers, which was just announced, we could put into our code and ship right now without having to wait for, for browser manufacturers to actually integrate it into their runtime because it compiles down to a very basic set of JavaScript that's already supported on all platforms. Um, and it also lets us to, to build our own tools really easily. And in this case, I want to I wanna talk about you know, this, this nested JSON map. We've got the data that we actually want to access is three levels deep. Um, and we've got this function that you know, we want to pull out the data, transform it in some way. But we also want to assert in a safe way that all of the values we have actually exist and that they conform to the types that we expect them to. And this is the only real business logic of this code. The rest of it is just sort of annotation and, and data extraction. And so um, for us at Prismatic, we've taken our two popular open source libraries, Plumbing and Schema, and we've made them work in Clojure Script as well as Clojure. So this gives us some nice, the nice ability to do this sort of map extraction in the actual destructuring of arguments. And if you look down uh, at the last three arguments, we have these type annotations of string, number, and boolean. And schema will actually throw errors if a key isn't present or if it doesn't conform to our expected type. Um, and, and so that, that gives us a lot more safety. And this is all because ClojureScript provides the ability to sort of reshape the language to our specific use cases. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in the Clojure community who don't necessarily like these type annotations. But for us, they're a huge benefit. And so we get to pick and choose which parts are most useful to us and which parts we want to extend further functionality with. And we can do it without really giving up any of the existing Java e JavaScript ecosystem. Um, in this case, calculating the length of a tweet, I don't know if any of you have tried to do this. It's actually kind of complicated, because you have to determine what's actually a URL. And there, there are a lot of edge cases with URL detection. But Twitter provides a really, really nice library for doing a lot of this stuff in JavaScript. And so for us, we can use and import that JavaScript library very easily so that sort of 99% of the code we write is still in ClojureScript and still gives us all the benefits of that. But when we do need to use an existing JavaScript library, the interop is very, very simple. So now I, I want to move on and talk a little bit about DOM manipulation, specifically how React has a much more functional approach than everything else is out there. Um, the DOM and HTML was initially designed as a way to mark up static content that's coming down from the server. And then slowly over time, people wanted a, a little bit of interaction here and there. And now we're in a stage where you, know, you want these large interactive web apps, but you have this imperative API for DOM interaction that's, that's not really good for these large web apps. I think if, if any of us were to design a system purely in code, you know, no one would think that the best way to, to manage your data is to have a large, globally accessible, mutable object that everything just pounds on at once. Um, but that's what we have to do with the DOM. So I want to talk a little bit about an example from Prismatic. And, and how our product works is that we have a variety of different feeds that are about a specific topic, in this case, urban exploration. And the feed is a collection of stories 
that are tagged with specific topics. So since this is the urban exploration feed, everything is about urban exploration. But the top article is also about Japan, and the second article is also about water.、Um, and a user can follow a topic to indicate that they want more content about that particular、um, topic. And so when the user actually follows a topic, the underlying data change is actually very, very simple. We're just toggling a Boolean somewhere in our data model that says, you know, you're now following urban exploration. But that change has to be updated multiple places in the DOM. And, and when you're doing this manually,、um, it's, it's really hard to remember all of the differences and detect all of the differences here. And you're really just inviting errors by not.、Um, By not creating a system that, that manages this for you,、um, it's, it's sort of human nature to be forgetful. And anytime it's easy to forget something, there's going to be a bug. And the more things you have to remember, the more forgetful you're going to be.、Um, and nobody really does this manually anymore. Everyone's using sort of a lot of MVC frameworks. But I argue that a lot of these MVC frameworks aren't actually that much simpler.、Um, You have to use mutable state to do them. So, all it really does is it takes your DOM mutation and it shifts all of that mutable code into your, your JavaScript.、Um, and the, the, there's this tight binding between, sort of the tight coupling between templates and your data that, that really doesn't suggest that they should be in separate places.、Um, and when you do actually separate them out, you have enough. You need enough control flow in your templating language that you end up inviting a, inventing a whole second domain specific language just to do templating when you already have a fully featured language that you're doing the rest of your development in.、Um, and so we chose React as opposed to, to you know, Angular, Ember, or one of these because it completely encapsulates and ext-、um, abstracts away the DOM. So we never actually. Interact with the DOM ourselves, we just interact with React components and they propagate all of the necessary changes for us. And how a particular React component works is it has、um, it's a functional mapping, it has a render function, which is a functional mapping from our data to virtual DOM of what it would look like if that were the data. And so we get all of the power and expressivity of. Closure script or JavaScript when we're writing these render functions. And you get this sort of fully declarative, completely referentially transparent way of describing what your DOM should look like. And it encapsulates sort of all of the dynamic interactions and all of the dynamic state in a sing- single function. So it's really, really easy to reason about exactly what the DOM is going to look like given what your data looks like.、Um, And this actually makes it a lot easier to test because you do have this functional mapping from data to DOM.、Um, and I mentioned this before, but it's, it's worth repeating again. We're outputting virtual DOM here, not actual real DOM. And you can still compose these functions together, the, these components together, in a way that basically builds up a hierarchy、um, similar to the way you would do a DOM.、And And how this works now is when a user follows an interest,、um, they follow the, the travel interest in this case, and that propagates back to the data. And then React recomputes the entire virtual DOM, which sounds really inefficient, but it's far more inefficient to touch the real DOM. And so doing all of this in code is actually quite fast.、Um, and then React automatically does a diff. On the current virtual DOM and、um, the real DOM, and only actually writes the minimal change set. So, this essentially takes away all of the complexity that we would have had to do before of thinking about exactly where and how we need to update the DOM. All we do is we write this component hierarchy once, and then our actual interactions are just changing our application state. And everything else immediately propagates from there.、Um, as sort of a, an added benefit, event handlers become almost trivial to write.、Um, the reason event handlers are typically complicated in web development isn't because it's hard to write a function that, that sort of toggles a Boolean, 
it's because you get a lot of complexity from sort of the overhead of event handlers. Um, you have to make sure that you're not listening more than once, that you, you, you don't accidentally set it up twice, that the node you're trying to listen to actually exists right now, um, or that there, there's no reference loops between the DOM and your JavaScript. And, and really, when you're writing them in line on components that get blown away and updated as needed, you don't have to worry about any of this overhead anymore. Um, and it, it, it really lets you focus on the core problem, which is changing your application state, not worrying about how to change and mutate the DOM. Um, so Ohm combines React and ClojureScript in a, in a really nice way that, that sort of adds a lot of nice benefits for us. Um, the first is that, that we centralize our entire app state um, so that all of our event handlers and all of our um, client server communications all go to one giant mutable ref. Um, and this allows us to sort of deduplicate all of our client side state and put everything in a single canonical place. It makes it much easier to reason about the sort of direct mapping to our full application state to our full DOM rendering, which gives us some nice serialization benefits. Um, but you know, at first glance, that, that sounds really bad, because having a single giant mutable reference means that you know, we can't easily decompose into subcomponents, because, because how atoms work in ClojureScript is you sort of swap the entire value all at once. Um, and, and this is trivial to do with immutable data, because you can just pass down a smaller piece of your data and keep a pointer to it and let the child mutate it. But it becomes much harder when you want to do this in an immutable way. And so the Ohm provides a tool called cursors, which allows us to take this large application state and boil it down to just the actual part that we care about. Um, it provides a, a window, basically, into the, the managed ref as a whole that we can treat just like an atom. And when we update this atom, it immediately propagates that change back to the application state as a whole. And so this allows us to sort of decomplect all of our components from the actual application structure um, while maintaining the benefits of immutable data. And so if we look at um, this code here, we, we have in Prismatic the notion of a paginated list, which, which is a, items, a, a next URL to fetch more items, and a remaining count. And this is the way that we take sort of long sequences, like our, our scrolling feeds, and break them up into reasonable chunks. And because React handles all of the, the re-rendering whenever our data changes, if we want to generate a full feed, this is all of the code we need. It takes in one of these paginated lists. It doesn't care what kind of list it is or what the objects are in that list. It just fetches more from the server using the, the sort of same core abstraction and paginates everything in. Um, and sort of the ability to, to fill out an entire feed of information without ever actually thinking about the DOM means that our, our concerns really are separated in a way that they wouldn't be in another architecture. Um, so now I want to talk about sort of what this you know, having this large mutable object actually gives us some, some pretty neat performance benefits um, when using Ohm, because React has this method uh, called shouldComponentUpdate, which gets called every time it's about to recompute a, a particular virtual DOM from your component. And um, it defaults to true, which is why the entire tree got re-rendered last time. Um, and it defaults to true because it's, it's actually really complicated to tell if your reference to a piece of immutable data is, is different or not. You essentially would have to walk the entire data structure on both sides to determine a quality. Um, but in this particular case, we can do a simple, fast reference equality check on our immutable data. And that allows us to sort of prune parts of the tree that we don't actually need to recompute. So the only parts that, that really get recomputed here are the parts that have actually changed. 
Um, and afterwards, React still does the same sort of minimal change set to the DOM. So really, all we're doing is we're, we're eliminating all of this intermediate work that we would otherwise do that, that's really not necessary. Um, and so I want to talk about the, the last section, which is sort of, is it ready for production, um, which is the most common question I get when I'm trying to talk about this with people. Um, and I think the answer is, is mostly yes. Um, it works really, really great for us in production. Um, but it sort of really depends on your team. And I think for most people in this crowd, um, the, the answer is probably yes, too. Um, our architecture is a lot simpler than it used to be. Um, before we switched over, the, the sort of complexity had almost paralyzed our development because everything was so intertwined that whenever we tried to make a change, we would have to sort of refactor parts of our code base just to make even, even small changes. Um, and I, I don't know if this is true for other people, but I, I get a lot of joy out of using such a well-designed abstraction. And for me, this sort of I'm, I'm basically spending my entire day writing pure functions, um, either you know, data processing functions in, in ClojureScript or, or these nice you know, render functions that, that take in data and directly output to DOM. There's, there's less finickiness than I, I used to have to deal with. Um, and there's also a lot less context than I think there was before. Um, in our case, our back end and our front end now use the same language. Um, so any engineer is comfortable with, with sort of anything in our code base. And right now, the only way to achieve that on the web is to use Node on the back end. And as a sort of you know, machine learning and natural language processing company, that's not really an option for us. Um, and I, it's also everything is, is sort of fully functional and referentially transparent. So even an engineer who doesn't understand our system can come in and very, very easily see how a piece of data is being transformed into the DOM because it's sort of all laid out for him there in a single function. Um, so sort of anyone can jump in and immediately feel, com feel comfortable making changes. Um, which actually is, is really useful for us, because we're a fairly small product team, but we have a lot of back-end engineers who want product changes in the app. Um, it's also extremely expressive. Um, one of my coworkers wrote 2048, uh, the, the sort of popular game, in about 200 lines. And um, David Nolan, in his post introducing this, wrote the to-do MVC app in about 260. Um, and this expressiveness scales to larger code bases as well. Um, when we implemented this system for the first time, we went from sort of 26,000 lines of code to a little over 5,000, um, which, is, which is a pretty big reduction for us. Um, and it's because it's so much easier to reason about and all the context you need is, is sort of in one place, you get a lot fewer bugs than, than I think we used to have. Um, now, these are, these are sort of only the, the small ones that come from these inconsistencies. Every once in a while, you, you still get, you know, you, you, you still have typos, and, and they're usually a lot harder to track down when you do get them. But um, overall, I think the, the sort of volume of bugs decreases. Um, and when you actually compare it to a similar backbone architecture, um, it, it ends up being two to four times faster uh, for the for to do MVC benchmarks. And um, this wasn't even really a priority for us. Um, we're not at the sort of performance optimization stage, um, but it is a really really nice benefit. And I think all of these things, be, besides just you know uh, application speed. Um, all of these things together combine to make you know, a much faster development speed. And there's, there's no real tangible proof I can give to that besides our anecdotal experiences. But, but you know, we, we are building things faster. And we're, we're making 
you know, drastic redesigns or, or experimenting with new products in a way that, that we couldn't have done under our old architecture. Um, and there are definitely some caveats um, that makes it not necessarily right for everyone. Uh, I think it requires a, a fundamentally different way of, of thinking about UI development. Um, in the same way that, that when you first go from sort of an imperative object-oriented language to something that's more functional, um, you have to sort of switch your thinking. Um, when you move from traditional DOM manipulation to React, you, you have to go through a, a similar mental shift. Um, and it's, it's not a big mental leap, but, but you definitely do have to reason and structure your application much differently than you would under another system. Um, and it, you sort of have to figure things out on your own. You, you have to figure out how to structure things differently. And you know, ClojureScript, Ohm, and React are, are very new compared to Angular or JavaScript. And so when you run into a problem, you know, it's not going to be easy to just go to Google or Stack Overflow and find the answer to it. Um, there, there's not nearly as much of an ecosystem or as many developers around these technologies yet. Um, but if you're sort of willing to, to be adventurous, um, they do have a, a lot of performance benefits. Um, and for us, because we have our entire team on the language, we don't have any sort of uh, uh, downsides of, of people speaking different languages, um, which can frequently be a problem in larger organizations. Um, and I think the, the sort of, uh, I, wanna, I wanna give it, so I'm, I'm sort of wrapping up here. I wanna give a huge thanks to, to you know, the Cognitech guys and, and the React team, because they really you know, made these language and made these frameworks, or libraries, I should say, and, and sort of trailblazed in a way that allowed us to, to develop such a clean architecture. Um, I think that, that it's really easy to try these things out. Um, ClojureScript may be a little bit harder, um, but you know, immutable data, there are a lot of good JavaScript libraries out there for it. Um, and React itself, we specifically first tried it on a settings page um, without you know, re-architecting our whole app. And, and Facebook only uses it in, for small parts of the interaction on, on the Facebook app. And so you know, if, if you're thinking about this, I, I really do encourage you to, to try it in a small piece first, see how you like it. And then, if you're convinced, uh, sort of move to a larger, a larger implementation. Um, and then the last thing I want to do is, is sort of give a thanks to, to everyone at the Prismatic, where I work, um, first for sort of letting us try crazy new architectures like this. Um, and, and I think we, we implemented Ohm about a month after it was first open sourced. Um, so we were, we were definitely in the early development phase. And you know, uh, they also helped me refine a lot of this talk and, and listen to me you know, talk at them over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just give a, a huge thanks. Um, any questions? Um, yes and no. Uh, we basically, we tried it on an experimental feature branch. Um, so we tried it for uh, an independent project that wasn't our main app. Um, and then slowly that, that sort of independent project evolved into a redesign of our main app. And then we switched everything over. Um, so there was definitely a period where we were sort of supporting both JavaScript and uh, where we were supporting two different apps. Um, no, not with Interop. There was it was just you know two branches. We had we had the old version running, and we would go and fix bugs on it. But but all of our new feature development was happening in ClojureScript. Um, but that only lasted for you know a couple months. Um, yeah. Um, well, so 
it's, first off, it's not actually global. It's a single app state, but it's, it's passed in to the root component and then decomposed from there. Um, I think the reason that we wanted to decompose it is because, um, like in, in this case, you know, writing an interest label that has the entire application state linked to it is, is really complexing a lot of things together. That means every single component in this tree has to know about the full, the full state of the app. Um, and I think for us, because we are already using ClojureScript, the idea of using one giant immutable ref just sort of came naturally from that. No, this is, this is how Ohm works out of the box, yeah. So this, this wasn't our innovation. This, uh, this came from David Nolan. Anything else? Yep. Um, so the question is, you have inputs coming from user interaction, and you have inputs coming from the server, and did that cause any problems for us? Um, and I think the, the really nice thing about using a mutable or uh, a, a managed ref enclosure here is that you know you get JavaScript isn't multi-threaded, but you get a lot of the same benefits as if you were doing multi-threading with these atomic updates. So all you just have to make sure that you're, because you're going from sort of old state to new state, um, it's, it's almost impossible for the data to get out of sync. Um, and so the, sort of the worst thing that can happen is, um, you know, a user like double clicks a button and we've updated something locally and then a server requ request comes back and sort of overwrites their change. But the minute that change gets overridden, it's overridden, it's going to be reflected in the UI by React. And so the user knows what the underlying state is in a really transparent way, which allows them to sort of undo that. Um, I think it, it avoids, because of this sort of managed um, full state transfer, it avoids getting different places out of sync with each other, which is usually the, the problem there. Anyone else? Bueller? Cool.